Good afternoon to you all. Uh, I'm George Hastings, and uh, I'm sitting in for Lisa Herrick, our usual host at these meetings. And I want to welcome you all here today and thank you for attending this meeting. Um, as you know, we at 31st Street are currently working to help the Wisconsin Democrats elect the state Supreme Court judge in a very important race. But in this meeting today, we will address a critical ongoing issue facing our country, the rise of disinformation deliberately spread by the right wing to gain political advantage. If you're puzzled why so many Americans are falling for the illogical nonsense of people like Trump and DeSantis, and why so many citizens actually believe those alternative facts, which seem so obviously wrong to us, then our discussion today will help you better understand this phenomenon. And if you want to learn what you can do and what we can do together to fight against these this disinformation and lies, you've come to the right place and you're going to hit a, hear, hear a very informative discussion today. Now, for myself, I really thought about this issue of disinformation for several years now, and it's been a very uh, troubling one. Uh, it seems like the entire uh, foundation of democracy assumes that you have a well-informed citizen, not a disinformed citizenry. And I question myself whether democracy can even last if so many of my fellow Americans cannot distinguish between basic facts and sometimes ridiculous nonsense. But in, in recent months, I've been comfort, comforted and inspired by some examples of victories in the fight against right-wing disinformation in both this country and in others where right-wing information is also a major issue. For example, in recent weeks in our country, we've seen the chief apostles of election and denial at Fox News get exposed as liars who did not believe even a bit of their own lies about the alleged ele uh, election fraud in the 2020 election. We can also take inspiration, I think, from the phenomenon of disinformation in Russia, where as a result of Vladimir Putin's lies about Ukraine, we've seen thousands of Ukrainians and tens of thousands of Russian soldiers meet their deaths in a brutal war. Because while a significant portion of Russians seem to believe those lies, it also appears that many Russians, especially younger ones, are now rejecting the lies and are basically risking um, either deserting the country or risking everything by protesting against the war. We've also seen um, that in Iran, thousands of incredibly brave women are defying government lies and are out in the streets protesting against the oppression of women. The fact that people in Russia and Iran are risking their very lives in defiance of government lies gives me hope that in America we can summon the will to fight disinformation here. Finally, in my own extensive reading concerning the issue of disinformation of America, I've seen evidence that we can fight back effectively. So I invite you to listen to our presentation here today to learn about how we can fight back. In my view, the fight against disinformation may well be the most crucial way in which we can not only advance our own democratic agenda for improving our country today, but also help to preserve democracy for future generations. With that, I'll turn the floor back to our own 31st Street strategist, Jim Shelton. Jim? Great, and thanks, George. Um, I, 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 was, I was really inspired by that. So thank, thanks so much for that, good friend. Um, so I'm the um, you know, political analyst, and I'm gonna, as usual, just pretty much everybody here knows me. Uh, I'm gonna jump to some slides here, and just to get it started. Everybody see that and hear me? Okay. Um, great. So um, I'm going to be a little try to be a little briefer today because we want to really want to hear from uh, Nico Mele, uh, who's uh, really so good on this subject. 
Uh, I do like to talk a, a little bit about the general perspective and then some of the, our priorities before we get to that. So let's go ahead and start. Um, and we'll start with economic populism. So um, I'm this again, this is sort of the general perspective. I think this is the best thing we have, guys. No, not one thing, but uh, there, there are other things. But uh, I do think it's just our best sort of message um, for the uh, working class folks that we want to reach out to and to rural voters that we really need to kind of continue to hold on to or try to win back, I should say. And uh, Biden is actually, uh, uh, I, I won't say everything he's doing is perfect. Um, but he's definitely pushing this particular um, message. And here's part of it, um, just part of it, taxing the rich and corporations, I would say fairly, uh, not just soaking the rich, that sort of thing. But again, I like to show a little bit of data. This is, uh, I showed folks these kind of data from Navigator before, well-respected uh, national survey organization. And, um, just to sort of reinforce my point, this is one aspect of economic populism. We do have this issue with Social Security and Medicare and what were we gonna do about it? Um, and um, the, uh, we asked the questions about whether people wanna um, uh, cut benefits versus uh, taxing uh, rich people who make over $400,000 and rich corporations. Perhaps not surprisingly, um, you do get a strong uh, vote for that latter uh, alternative. And of course, some of it has to do with the uh, way it's asked, but notice it's actually true of Republicans and independents, especially uh, as well. Um, of course, it's not that simplistic. My own view is we do need some reform of social security and Medicare, but just to just to try to support my argument just a little bit. One other uh, survey thing that caught my eye is a little bit older, but it has to do with the hearings that the Republicans are doing in the House. And uh, I don't think they're getting much traction. Now they'll probably get some, and again, maybe you know the right-wing media will try to blow it up and so forth, but they start off with a, a, a sense that people are pretty skeptical of that. And especially once you know people become sensitized to it. So uh, I just thought I'd show that especially by the first slide, the general point is on most issues, when you actually get into the content, what Democrats are proposing are, you know, they are winners. And our problem is that, you know, there is a messaging problem to some extent, but also we do have this severe handicap with disinformation um, that part of what we're gonna be addressing. So I can't resist, I uh, put together this rogues gallery uh, of these folks that we all know. And uh, it motivates me a little bit just to see their faces because then I, you know, I know what, kind of what we're up against. But just all to remind that they're not really advocating for anything that's constructive. Anti-woke, cultural wars, maybe against the war in Ukraine, but they're not, you know, they're not proposing anything constructive. And of course, it's easier to do that it's easier to be uh, counterproductive than to try to get things done. So now, uh, uh, if you bear with me to sort of now shift to our state priorities, you'll see this slide again, unless we change it, which we could, but we really are focused um, on Pennsylvania, always Pennsylvania for reasons we know it, we are near it, it's so important. We've now adopted Wisconsin, not just for, I think, for the Supreme Court race, but because it's so important for the presidential race, and we'll come back to that. And Virginia, again, in our backyard, and um, is uh, got everybody in the legislature up for re-election, and it's a total, uh, like, I don't know, fruit salad, toss salad, up in the air kind of thing, because all the districts have been redistricted, and very significantly. And, but we need to keep a hand in North Carolina and Georgia, I would say, especially North Carolina. I'll come back to that a little bit. Then we, um, uh, and I'm glad George made the thing, the statement that he did, because we have this issue of elections versus kind of longer term effectiveness. 
And, um, you know, it, it's not totally either or, or, but just to kind of look at the, the menu, if you look at 2023, yes, we've got the Wisconsin Supreme Court in red here. Uh, we got the Virginia legislature. We got some things going on in Pennsylvania. That's not, that's not much else. And it's always good to be working in campaigns and campaigns are interesting and sometimes rewarding and even fun when we win. But um, compared to what we need to do in 2024, it's just huge. Uh, um, presidency, both houses of uh, Congress and so forth. And logically and rationally and strategically, we should really be putting the major part of our effort, in my view, in trying to get ready for 2024, assuming that we have good things that we can, we can support. And I would say that we do. So uh, that brings us to our infrastructure priorities. Those are the things I was just talking about. We have these grassroots groups that I think um, you know, especially in Pennsylvania and North Carolina even, uh, we're actually pretty effective, maybe very effective. Uh, and I'm really glad we did that in the last cycle. But just, you know, what happens is they atrophy, everything atrophies. <laughs> and I heard uh, this week that one of the major uh, grassroots groups in North Carolina that we didn't support, but a major one, they have furloughed everyone. So I guess they're still operating, but you know we need to kind of try to help sustain these folks and help them grow if we're we get if we're going to do well. And of course, the Democratic state parties, and we have a major ally with Span. I don't want to go into that. I'm so thankful to have them as good collaborators. We'll be, uh, I think, working with them. But then we also have now added anti-right wing propaganda, uh, and I've got it in red because it's a topic. Uh, for today. It's such so important. And I do think we're beginning to see that there are things that we, we can do to, to weigh in to help. And um, it just making that same point, this needs to be an infrastructure building year um, significantly. Okay, so now who knows who this is? Everybody raise your hand who knows who this. So this is uh, Clayton Anderson the new chair of the North Carolina Democratic Party. They had a complete overhaul. She's 25 years old and she's got a lot of energy and I think uh, you know a certain amount of, of likability, even charisma. But more importantly, she's got together a good team in North Carolina. And according to Martha Lanning at SPAN, they are undertaking the important things that you need to do as a state democratic party uh, in North Carolina, especially the kind of organizing and the organizing structure that we've tried to uh, um, uh, support uh, in other states. So, uh, you know, uh, they have a, a, a lot of challenge, but they, I think uh, are, uh, and, and mostly they're gonna need money, of course, they need to get an executive director and so forth, but they're on the right track. So that brings us to North, uh, to uh, Wisconsin, of course, um, and our great candidate, Janet Protosiewicz. I will say that the Democrats, as best I can tell, have done everything right in this election. And I'm happy that we're weighing in as well. Uh, they, the Democrats have a multifocal, you know, they're doing all the media stuff. They're doing grassroots stuff. They got the party, they got the, the um, NGOs working together, they're doing canvassing and so forth. The, uh, the, the Republicans seem to be, um, uh, best I can tell, mostly um, uh, relying on uh, television attack ads. And of course they're, they're attacking her for being soft on crime, which she isn't, but they're trying. And uh, we've had the advantage of getting out earlier, actually having more effective money spent. And I'm very happy with Ben Wickler and the general effort of which I'm proud that we have a, a significant part with our two grassroots groups. Uh, this was in the newsletter the other day, but it's one of our canvassers um, in the sort of Western middle part of uh, Wisconsin. And it turns out that in the Grow area, they have two uh, branches of the University of Wisconsin. And uh, this is one canvasser out in the snow and they've done this in two subsequent major snowstorms. 
So they're doing the work uh, for us. Uh, we just need to help them a bit more so they can finish uh, strong. We're almost there, uh, as Mary will tell you, in terms of contributions. Um, and uh, we, we are gonna actually have some people ourselves doing a bit of canvassing out there to help as well. Not there, but in Wisconsin. So um, this is the other point that I made again at our last meeting, but it's, it's so profound, I'm gonna do it again, which is just why Wisconsin is so very, very important for the presidential election amongst other things and winning the Supreme Court race will help us on that as well. But just to uh, remind folks that this interesting schema just ranks all the states in their 2020 vote for how democratic or Republican they were from DC on the left to Wisconsin on the right. And uh, you notice the blue gets a little paler and paler the more we get to, to the middle. And um, you know, uh, to get to 270, even if we have Pennsylvania and Nevada and Michigan and so forth, we still need Wisconsin. I mean, we could do it with Arizona, but I don't think we can count on that. And we could do it with Georgia, but I know we definitely don't want to count on that. So it just makes Wisconsin so strategically important. And that's why we believe supporting these grassroots groups um, now and probably somewhat more down the line will put them in a better position to be helping in next year. So now a we'll switch to anti-disinformation. Um, many of you know I've recommended this terrific book by Dan Pfeiffer, which I think is really good in laying out the problem. Um, but also, um, and we're, we're gonna have Nico in just a minute, but we are also doing a uh, major webinar, uh, just kind of save the date. And, uh, you know, Julie Greenberg is the leading light in all this and has been bringing me along with it but we're gonna have this webinar uh, with Dan Pfeiffer and Tara McGowan, who's uh, another wonderful authority and actor in uh, anti-disinformation. Uh, her organization is called Courier Newsroom. She's not gonna be just talking about her, her own organization. She's gonna be talking about opportunities, but uh, hopefully we're gonna try to get a lot of people. We're gonna try to coordinate with a lot of other organizations to see if we can't get a huge turnout uh, for that event on the 26th. And then lastly, um, again, I've showed this slide before, but it's to give people a bit of a taste of how we're thinking strategically about um, anti-disinformation. There are these three levels that you can think of. There's kind of a structural level that's really kind of beyond most of what we can do directly there are at what uh, a sort of reactive level where people sort of listen to what disinformation is going on and then, then enlist people to kind of respond to it uh, kind of on their own, but in an intelligent way. That, that's useful as well. But we also think that people, there are organizations out there that are in what we call a competitive arena, um, including uh, various, a lot of it relates to various efforts to support local news which is not only um, important because it's um, uh, dying um, and to some extent, but also because in many surveys, uh, voters will say, oh yeah, that's what I, 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 I like to get news from local sources. Um, they don't necessarily trust any national media and, and so forth. So um, anyway, these this this is gonna we're gonna try to raise some money for this just to kind of um, and and also try to promote with other people, other organizations that they should be uh, you know I I would like to think of it as more like a groundswell than anything else to, because it's such an important problem and there are things that we can do so. Without any uh, more ado, just uh, uh, turning now in a minute to, to Nico. And uh, of course, our general practice is not to consume time by um, giving long introductions. But let me just say that Nico is uh, very knowledgeable about anything and everything having to do with uh, uh, disinformation and what we might do about it. So I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Nico. Over. Thank you. Really uh, a pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, you know, my name's Nico. I have a 
background. I spent 10 years as a political consultant and uh, 15 years in the media industry as a news executive. Uh, most notably, I was the deputy publisher of the Los Angeles Times with a uh, responsibility for running that business. I was not, I'm not a journalist. I, I was a business executive with PL responsibility. Uh, I also spent four years as uh, on the faculty at Harvard where I remain adjunct, but I was full-time faculty and ran a research center called the Shorenstein Center on politics and media. And so uh, I, I really appreciate your time and I'm going <clears> to <throat> try and be judicious and uh, just run through a few slides and then would be happy to take questions and engage um, in a discussion. Um, so first, I just wanted to say thank you. I, you know, Ben Wickler in Wisconsin is one of my oldest friends, 20 years now. And, you know, I just, I, hearing everything you're doing really just gives me so much hope for the effort you're all putting into combating what I really truly believe is a, uh, terrifying moment for America facing a real chance of an authoritarian regime here. Um, so, you know, I'm going to start by just talking a little bit about what I think has happened. This is a, this is a graph of newspaper revenue in the last half century. It's collapsed, right? Print revenues collapsed. The reason for that is relatively simple. 2014, 2015, when I was at the LA Times, uh, a full color ad on a on a Sunday was a, uh, well, actually it was about forty grand to reach four hundred thousand readers. To buy the same ad on our website to reach the same four hundred thousand readers is about five thousand six hundred dollars, but you could reach the same four hundred thousand readers with sixteen dollars in Google search ads, and so this kind of collapse of advertising revenues decimated the industry. To give you an idea, in 1980, there were the same number of steel workers in America as local journalists. And um, today, actually, there's the, the decline has been much faster, much more aggressive in newsrooms. And, you know, we have a whole idiom to discuss in culturally the decline of, of, of the steel industry, the Rust Belt, etc. But we really you know, the collapse of local news is not on our radar at all, kind of culturally, when we think about the world. Um, and this collapse has real consequences. The first is there's a lot less local reporting. This is a 2014 study from the Pew Research Center, 2014, 10 years ago. 21 states have no reporters on Capitol Hill. That's 42 U.S. senators who in their seven years in Washington, D.C., never get asked a question by a local reporter. And there's great work out of UNC, uh, uh, an academic there, Penny Abernathy, uh, uh, on news deserts, where she's really tracked the hollowing out of news in America. You know, one example here is the Denver Post uh, in 1980. I believe it had 400 full-time journalists. Today it has about 20. Um, and that's one of the fastest growing metropolitan areas in America during that time and one of the wealthiest. So, uh, you know, there's a lot less local news. Two is there's a lot less trust in what there is. The things that are filling the void, people don't really trust. A lot of research here in this decline in trust, but newspapers taking it very hard. And then I'd say that uh, the vacuum created by the collapse of the local news has led to it being filled with junk, right, with crap. So this is a study we did at Harvard while I was there of the top, this is the top um, 50 mainstream news audiences on Facebook by audience size, probably too small for you to read, but all the way on one side is BBC News, about 50 million readers on Facebook. And you can kind of see there's everything from the Atlantic, Politico, LA Times, Wired, BuzzFeed, Univision, et cetera. This is the top 100 junk news sources on Facebook in that study. And this is them on the same graph. You can right away visually get a sense of how if your primary social source of news is social media, 
which it is for most Americans, your uh, what you're consuming is full of junk. When I say junk, I don't call it fake news per se. Uh, I call it junk because usually there's some real stuff in there uh, just to confuse it more. Very hard to, to parse it. In particular, I'm kind of obsessed with the role of right-wing media in America as mainstream media in this day and age. You know, uh, you can kind of look at every uh, media channel in America, national TV, local TV, radio, digital streaming, social media, digital media, and the, the audiences are overwhelmingly served first and foremost, by what I would call right-wing propaganda. Um, they just dominate the, the, the sphere. So, you know, some of you will recall there was an email sent in, you know, 2006, we think it was sent that said, uh, Barack Obama is a Muslim born outside the United States. And uh, we don't really know who's, who sent it. Uh, the Washington Post estimates 100 million Americans uh, received that email. Uh, but it really launched this whole notion that Obama's a Muslim not born in the United States. And I sometimes call that the, the email that launched 1,000 PhD theses. In the last 25 years or so, there's been an enormous amount of academic research on misinformation. and I have usefully boiled it down to three main findings for you. <laughs> the first is that rumors are sticky. The brain likes, human brains like things that are that feel that feel like they might be true. <laughs> right? The brain just has an affinity for them. Uh, the second is that corrections basically don't work. Uh, the mo you know, the academic literature generally says if you say it's not true that Barack Obama is a Muslim, what people remember five days later is the repetition of Barack Obama is a Muslim, not the correction. And then finally, you know, source credibility is paramount. If someone has decided they don't trust the New York Times, it really does not matter, you know, what you say, they're not going to trust the New York Times. Um, and, and that has all kinds of spillover effects when you think about the role of right-wing propaganda in this landscape I just articulated. And so because Jim uh, was very uh, explicit that I had to present solutions or things that were actionable, I'm going to use these three kind of major findings around misinformation to talk about what I think can be done. So if rumors are sticky... Well, then we need ways of making the truth louder. Uh, you know, my focus is really honed in on uh, local news, that um, it's very easy to spread a lot of misinformation about Joe Biden. It's much harder to combat, oh, well, this bridge was in our town was repaired by the Build Back Better bill that Biden championed and passed, right? Uh, local news has, I think, a very profound effect in reaching people and helping to inoculate them against some of the crazier stuff that's out there. Now, uh, and so I, I'm really focused in a variety of ways on what we can do to, to help local news. And I can talk through uh, some of the groups out there doing this work, both for profit and nonprofit, but that's, that's a crucial part of it. You know, I think some of the work you're doing in Courier Newsroom is really important in terms of uh, amplifying uh, some those messages and making the truth louder. One, one problem we have with making the truth louder is that the digital platforms uh, have a huge role in amplification and uh, tend to amplify things in ways that are opaque. We don't even understand. Um, I could talk more about that if you want. And the second is corrections backfire. And so we need to seek alternative narratives. Rather than saying Barack Obama is not a Muslim uh, or Barack Obama is a Muslim is a lie, we have to say, oh, look at these photos of Obama's baptism. Oh, this is the church where Obama was baptized. We have to frame things very differently. 
And uh, that is a real problem for the traditional media. You know, the traditional media really was, you know, what was taught in journalism schools is a kind of gotcha journalism um, and alternative narratives, you know, they're really taught to correct, not to not to tell stories differently. And there's some very good work being done by an organization called the Solutions Journalism Network uh, to try and train traditional newsrooms to tell stories differently, to find alternative narratives that don't um, amplify or propagate lies and, and misinformation. And then finally, you know, source credibility being paramount, you know, I think looking for ways to in involve tribal leaders, um, you know, uh, a good example of this is, is like I talked about, like, you know, talking about the bridge that was built in our, in our town because of the Build Back Better bill and getting uh, local leaders like the local police chief to talk about how great that is for traffic, right? Looking, looking to leaders in the community who are trusted uh, and trying to bring them into the narrative in, 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 in ways that are as strong as possible. Um, so th that's kind of my, uh, my short-ish summary. And, you know, I thought I would, uh, I thought I would just uh, uh, stop and, and, and take your questions and engage in a, in a little bit of discussion here. Happy to, happy to give you a little more detail about uh, some of these, uh, some of the work being done in this space, but I kind of wanted to hear where you all were at. Karen, are you uh, yeah. ready yeah, to get some questions here? Yes, uh, so hi, I'm Aaron Hamburger. I am the membership chair and also the Q&A uh, manager at 31st Street Swing Left. And I see right away we have a question from Jim Shelton. So Jim, go ahead. Yeah, and talking to you before, um, Nico, um, Nico, I should say, sorry, I got that wrong. Um, anyway, um, you have an initiative to actually help people create local online newspapers themselves, and you've done that yourself. <laughs> um, can you describe that and sure. how, you know what might be involved in doing that? Sure. So I uh, live in Lexington, Massachusetts. Uh, you know, um, uh, frankly, a, a very wealthy and well-educated town. I think we have the highest number of postdocs per household of any <laughs> zip code in America, thanks to Harvard and MIT. Um, we have, uh, I believe, three Nobel Prize winners who live in the town. Um, so we're, we're a little bit of an anomaly, I would say. Uh, but I decided uh, during COVID, I have three kids in uh, grade school and middle school. And during COVID, I, I, could, I just was desperate to figure out when they might go back to school and who would make that decision and how would that happen. And I couldn't figure it out on my own. And I'm like a smart guy. You know, I was like, uh, tenure track faculty at Harvard here. Uh, and so I, um, I started a news, uh, I wouldn't call it a newspaper, it's all digital, but it's a weekly email newsletter. It goes out Fridays at 6am. Um, I, um, uh, I, we have one full-time journalist, lovely woman, who is the editor of her uh, college newspaper who I hired right out of college. Um, she writes two to three stories a week. They go out in the email newsletter, and the, the, it's become a real hub for the community in, in a dozen ways. And, um, you know, I, of course, prior to starting this, had spent uh, almost a decade telling other people how to do this without actually having done it myself. Uh, telling other people I do this based on my market research in the industry and my academic research at Harvard. And, and so I was a little terrified to actually have to take my own advice. <laughs> and I was relieved that it, it worked. Um, you know, it's a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, we raise about $60,000 a year, uh, average gift of $100. Uh, all donors, approximately uh, 500 donors, all of them in Lexington. And, um, uh, and that funds one full-time journalist. And uh, as, as, as our budget grows and the gifts continue to come in, uh, we're hiring freelancers and, and likely to expand our work. 
So um, uh, this model, uh, and I can get it, there's a, actually a lot more detail in this model, but this, this model uh, is one I have helped now somewhere north of 500 communities all over the country from Alaska to Iowa implement. And um, I think there's a, a lot of potential in it. Uh, but what it really does require is, you know, essentially someone willing to bite the bullet and drive the process and and also not, you know, not to put too much of a thumb on the scale, at least initially. Um, so uh, I can I can talk more about that, but I know there's there's other questions. Yes, we are being bombarded with questions. So clearly you're striking a nerve here. Uh, so uh, George Gaines has his hand up and then I have a few in the chat. So George, if you want to answer, ask your question. Yes, I do. Um, I think probably more than anything else, this is uh, all about me, but I would prefer to think that uh, a lot of our folks may have a similar thought. I, I, I happen to uh, very much like yard signs and putting signs on my uh, stickers on my car uh, and and that sort of stuff. And I have found that a number of my neighbors, a number of my relatives, a number of my friends have the same reaction when I do any of that of, oh, you need to be careful. You know, they can really mess up your house. Oh, they will come do something to your kids. Okay, all George, this, can you get negative. to the question? Because we got a lot of people want to ask questions. Oh, so okay, I'm please sorry. Please it on your question. How do we fight the negative impact to not react to the negative uh, stuff that's on the web and everywhere? Great. Yeah, I think that the, the issue of uh, how do you handle misinformation, right-wing disinformation is tough. Like, you know, famously, you will all remember John Kerry in 04 ignored the Swift Boats attack, and that turned out to really be a bad idea. Uh, you know, I think traditionally in, in politics, political analysts, political consultants, you know, the traditional view has always been... Um, you ignore absurd attacks because by responding to them, you give them oxygen, right? And uh, I think that that's, uh, I, I think that that sometimes is true, but frankly, in this day and age, I think it's really important to really aggressively respond to attacks, to try and shut them down before they can grow. And the trick is to be as authoritative as possible. You know, one example is Obama lived almost his entire presidency with this notion that uh, he was born outside the United States and was a Muslim. And uh, I personally, uh, you know, I even uh, uh, had it out with Chuck Todd, who was a, is a friend. And I, Chuck Todd had, you know, Mitch McConnell on Meet the Press and never asked him, do you believe Barack Obama is a Muslim born outside the United States? You know, like... Republican leaders were never confronted and asked to like explicitly reject this to kill it. Um, and so Obama lived with it. And, uh, you know, it was really interesting to me uh, that at the White House uh, press correspondence dinner, Obama made uh, his whole stick about uh, making fun of making fun of this rumor he was born outside the United States, uh, that he didn't have a birth certificate, right? He he really uh, went to town. And what they did very cleverly is, that there, I, I don't remember the exact chronology. I wrote it up in a case study at one point, but I think it was like on Wednesday, they released his birth certificate. On Friday at the White House press correspondence dinner, he, he made a number of jokes about it, humiliated Donald Trump and said, uh, oh, they found a video of my birth. And it's the opening of the Lion King, right, where the baby lion is born. And um, and really, it was hilarious. And then on Sunday, he kills Osama bin Laden. And that was meant to show executive force and power, right? So they really teed this week up to try and kill the notion that he was born outside the United States and did not have a birth certificate with overwhelming force. 
Uh, I'm going to just reply directly to uh, some of the questions in the chat here. You know, Brian and Dorothy asked about the effort to help traditional journalists learn to frame things differently. It's called the Solutions Journalism Network, and I put the link to it in the chat there. Mm -hmm. Anne's asking about the Knight Foundation. The Knight Foundation actually explicitly does not support local, won't support journalists. It's somewhat inexplicable to me, but they have a policy as a foundation that they don't support news gathering, uh, in part because uh, they just can't support everything that comes their way. However, there's something called Newsmatch that the Knight Foundation and a group of other foundations have done, which is uh, a group a group of some of the largest foundations in America have pooled their resources to start something, I'll put it in the chat, called Newsmatch, where local newsrooms uh, can apply to have every contribution uh, from basically Thanksgiving to the end of the calendar year matched by these foundations. And so I, I did it with my local newsroom, uh, and it was pretty pretty important to our financial viability. Um, uh, so so you know so so th that's a that's a way they do this. Another. Another thing that they tend to do, big foundations do, because they don't want to support individual journalism, is they they support efforts to bring sustainability to it. One I'm on the board of, and I've been very involved with, is called the News Revenue Hub, a nonprofit that helps small local newsrooms build sustainable revenue. I think that relates to a question that came up earlier in the chat, which is, what can we do as individuals uh, to best support these kinds of efforts? Sure. Well, uh, I, I think um, I think that uh, anything you can do to support some of the work of organizations like like uh, the News Revenue Hub, like Solutions Journalism, uh, is is excellent. I think um, you know your own work in helping and supporting, encouraging the local news ecosystem in your own communities is important. It's it's really challenging when you look at a place like Wisconsin. You know, I have never set foot in Wisconsin, uh, but I really uh, am very focused on what's happening there, been helping uh, the party there for, for years, um, but how, trying to figure out how to help local news in Wisconsin so that there is some uh, counterweight to the right-wing propaganda that truly floods the state is, is, uh, is, is hard. I've talked with Ben about it. He and I actually spoke on a panel two weeks ago about this, um, about trying to, to, to build resiliency in, in, local, uh, in local news in Wisconsin. Um, I, I'm, 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 I'm part of a part, I'm, I'm really, I, uh, I'm leading an effort to try and raise funds to buy local newspapers in Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania that might otherwise uh, shut down. Uh, to buy them in order to try and keep them alive and provide uh, that counterweight. One of the things that Ben's been very helpful with is uh, looking at ways. Uh, I, I help I help make this happen in Colorado. We, we uh, 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 three local community foundations in Colorado uh, put together some of the capital to allow us to buy. Um, a group of uh, hyper local newspapers in Colorado that otherwise would have closed, um, and that are so the nonprofit is managing these previously for profit newspapers. So, so there are efforts like that, but it's it's diffuse and it's kind of in the er this is a this is work that's in its kind of early stages, I would say, and 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 rendered more challenging because of the very local nature of it. You're right. Got it. Got it. Okay, we have time for two quick questions. Uh, one came to me uh, through the chat and one I see uh, Denise has her hand up. So the first one is, um, uh, how do you think the Dominion lawsuit could affect Fox's yeah. capture in the long run? Just if you could give a brief answer and then I'll invite Denise to um, ask her question quickly as well. And then we'll uh, wind up. I think the Dominion lawsuit is is potentially you know, pretty transformative to this landscape. Um, uh, you, you know, in my in my view, if if investors, if if Wall Street, if the market understands that there's enough shareholder risk in the in the reporting practices of Fox News, that that'll become a very big problem for the corporation. Mm -hmm. Now, now, uh, 
that, that that rests on the judge finding in favor of of Dominion, which hard. I'm I'm not a lawyer and not an analyst, but I, I've read actually every word in the case. Hard to believe that they don't, but you never know. the The courts are are are, are very challenging in America these days, uh, and and even even liberal justices have been challenging on this question of um, of uh, of libel. Uh, so uh, we'll see. I, I do think there are two important things to recognize about. Uh, even if Fox faces major uh, headwinds financially because of these lawsuits and it leads them to kind of scale back their reporting, it, it's a major business dilemma for them. Uh, every time they have tried to back off of uh, of 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 Trump and his lies, uh, they they lose viewers, they lose ground, yeah, and and then they come back to it. And yeah. so I'm very curious to see how that plays out. And the second thing is. You know, I had that slide showing right-wing misinformation is the mainstream media in America. Fox is a is a very important, very large node in that ecosystem, but it is not the only one. Mm. Um, and uh, but I think Fox, 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 Fox losing in that lawsuit, uh, facing significant punitive damages, uh, uh, facing the likelihood of other lawsuits being filed on that front. I know of, I know of, I think a dozen in progress in one way or another. Uh, I think would be really, really pretty, uh, pretty, pretty transformative to the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Okay, very quickly, uh, Denise, if you want to ask your question, uh, and then anyone else who has a question that didn't get answered, uh, feel free to put it in the chat, and I'm sure Nico will stick around to answer those questions. Um, Denise, did you want to? Yeah, it's actually George, not Denise is over here, but I'm George, okay. and I have a question. Great. Given that Tucker Carlson and others at Fox News are amply proven and self-admitted liars, why does their audience continue to listen to them? If, is it because they don't care and they're perfectly happy to listen to his lies, knowing that they're lies? Or is it because they don't know that he's been lying and Fox News hasn't told them? And if that's the case, how do we ever burst into their bubble? You know, uh, if I had a really good answer for you, you know, I might I might live in a more expensive home, uh, drive a nicer car. The you know the best i can tell you is that you know that 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 there's this idea if you want the most academic version of it it's a guy out of yale dan kahan it's called cultural cognition dan's research has been all about how why if you present someone evidence that they're wrong their position hardens right like why do people believe things that aren't true and why is it so hard to change their minds? And his answer is that it actually has nothing to do with the issue. It has to do with their their kind of identity and sense of who they, you know, who their tribe is. Uh, cultural cognition uh, is 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 the is the academic term. And I'll put a the Wikipedia page on it is pretty decent. Um. And so, you know, that, that's the best answer I have on the Fox News front, that, um, that it really isn't about any single issue, uh, whether it's true or false. It's about a sense of my identity, who I am, uh, the communities I participate in, and the threats and challenges to those communities. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also think that you know, you 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 reference this a little bit. I think Jim in his opening remarks, but uh, there's a lot. You know, broadly speaking, if you talk to political scientists and ask them how, why did Trump win, why did his message resonate, I'm oversimplifying it, but they're basically split into two camps: those who think that it was really about race and racism, and those who think that it was about uh, uh, income inequality and economic populism. And probably, of course, it's about both. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but I think if you take if you take kind of the 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 income gap and you combine it with a with um, some racism and a sense of hopelessness, and then you layer on it a very 
thick topping of media that riles you up and uh, social media that kind of algorithmically encourages fear and anxiety, uh, I think you end up in a very toxic place where puncturing those rumors and narratives and beliefs it, it is not is not easily done. You know, Jim kind of teed it up well that there's the immediate races to be won to protect the democracy, the institutions. Then there are the longer term questions of how we really we actually have some long term systemic change. Well, and, I think this is yeah, really so. yeah. I think this has been a really kind of great taste of I think a long conversation that we're going to and a long fight we're going to be involved with for some time to come. So. Uh, we really appreciate you being here, Nico. And um, again, I encourage you, if you did not uh, get your question answered, please go ahead, put it in the chat, and I'm sure uh, Nico will continue the conversation there. Uh, I'm going to hand the mic back over to Jim. Well, I guess, and then I'm going to hand it over to Mary. Great. She's going <laughs> to, she has the next piece for us all, Wisconsin. Hello, I'm Mary Pence, um, and so, you know, when I think about the battle to win control of the Wisconsin Supreme Court, one issue that the court will be dealing with is very important to me. Because for me, one woman denied the opportunity to obtain a safe legal abortion is one woman too many. So when the Dobbs decision was handed down, an old Wisconsin statute became effective again. And when the Wisconsin Supreme Court decides the case as to whether to strike down that old statute, I want Judge Janet to be sitting on that court. So 31st Street has set a goal of raising $150,000 for two grassroots groups working in the rural parts of the state, Grow Action and Progress North. So far, we have raised $142,000 and we need to raise just 8,000 more in order to reach our goal. I know that many, perhaps most of you on this call have already contributed, some twice. But would you consider giving just one more time? My husband and I have contributed $4,000 to Wisconsin, and we are going to contribute one more time. The blocks in this pyramid represent the total we need to raise to achieve our goal, $8,000. Would you please look at this chart and identify the highest block that represents the highest amount that you feel you can contribute? If you are well off, ask yourself, if I don't fill this block, who will? And if you are not well off, then pick a lower row. Dan and I have already picked our block. Will you join us? Thank you so much. Okay, so it looks like the next thing we're going to have is uh, an update on our Wisconsin Working America letters with Roberta. Great. Um, thanks, Jim. And um... Thanks, Nico, by the way, that was such an interesting presentation. Um, and uh, and Mary, yours too on fundraising. Um, I just contributed again. <laughs> uh, we're almost there, so I hope everybody else does too. So um, I'm giving an update, as Jim said, on the Working America letters that we've been doing for um, Wisconsin. For those of you who don't know, Working America is a nonprofit group. It's a subsidiary or of the AFL-CIO. And um, it's, of course, AFL-CIO is all union people. But what, uh, what they do through Working America is they reach out to non-unionized, uh, non-college educated working people of all backgrounds. 
Uh, and so um, it's so it's one way. It's a really important way that Democrats can reach out uh, to reach the voters that we have lost a lot of, and to try to bring them back into the progressive fold. Uh, and we, as part of what we did this time for work, for Working America, is they they asked Thirty First Street to uh, work on a group of experimental letters. Uh, on subjects that they hadn't really tried out before, either at all, or with particular demographics. Um, and so we, we signed up to do uh, 1,500 letters for them on reproductive rights, first of all. That's something they haven't tried before. So we're helping them do their research and figure out if that's successful. The second topic is election integrity, which they are doing on their general letter writing campaign in Wisconsin. But for us, they had us send it to a particular group of voters to see how it would resonate with, with uh, that demographic group. So I'm happy to report that thanks to so many of you on um, this call and others uh, who signed up, we have all of our letters uh, accounted for. So everybody has signed up for the 3000 letters and most people have completed them. Uh, the deadline for mailing the letters is Tuesday, March 21st. Uh, and uh, we still have a few folks who are um, who have letters in the works. And so I'm encouraging you to finish them. And really importantly, if there's any reason you can't finish them, uh, real, there, we have no judgment. We don't shame anybody. If you can't do it, we understand life happens and, and things get, get ahead of you. So let John Medallia or me know if you aren't able to complete the letters you've signed up for. We'll put our uh, email contacts in the chat and just let us know because we have people who've volunteered to do those letters for folks who can't finish them. Um, and so that's just really my most important message, immediate message right now. If you can't finish them, let us know. And uh, then we'll get them assigned so we get all of them completed. So um, Great. that's all I need to say. And if I missed anything, let me know. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Roberta. Uh, yeah. We're going to shift now to Catherine to talk to us about canvassing in Wisconsin. Hi. Um, yeah, so Diane Capellian and I are planning to um, drive to Wisconsin uh, starting on Friday, getting there Saturday, and to work through the election on April 4th. Um, the uh, Southeast Regional Organizer for um, the Wisconsin Dems is looking for housing for us, and he is happy to look for housing for anybody else who might want to come. Um, He's asked us to work first for a week in Kenosha and then um, for uh, after early voting's over um, to go to Racine. So um, I did a little research today on those two communities and their election results and their demographics. Um, it's you know wider, I would say, than areas that we usually go into, um, but at least that I do anyway, um, Pittsburgh, Georgia, uh, Harrisburg. Anyway, um, but uh, the margin um, in those two, commu two communities um, for election results in the last four years is like 1% or less than 1% favoring Republicans. So it's an area where um, it seems like it's really, really important to um, emphasize to people who are Democratic voters that they actually go vote. So anyway, if anybody's interested in going, um, you know, let me know, let Diane know, let if you don't have our contact information, let somebody else know and find us. So as much as anything, this is just to celebrate the fact that the two of you are going to go and spend a week and a half mm -hmm. um, in what will not be wonderful weather uh, to do, uh, you know, what you could call the Lord's work. So thank you very much for that. Sure. So George, you have some closing for us? Oop, I have to unmute, thank, Mac, thank you. Um, well, we're at the end of our presentation uh, of 
part of our program. So uh, I just want to thank you all for being here. Uh, we think we've introduced you today to uh, a, a, an issue we haven't talked about, about before in 31st meetings, this idea of fighting disinformation. And uh, Nico has given us a, a good start on that and given us some ideas about how we can fight. It's an issue we're going to work on uh, in the future uh, and see what we can do together as a group. Um, so we're at the end of our program. Uh, we, in, uh, we're, if you, if those of you who want to, certainly feel free to, to leave the Zoom. We're going to stay on. Nico is going to stay on a little bit, take some more questions uh, for another 15 minutes or so. So uh, those of you who want to stay, please do. Those of you who are going to leave us, we thank you again for tuning in, and we'll see you again.